Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me. This is Tom Christie with d20play.com. Today we're going to look at how to DM Ben Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, House of Lament. A fantastic adventure. I have the chance to run it one time. There's some very good uh, real actual play videos out there. I have my actual play videos out there as well you can check out. Uh, please hit that like button and enjoy this video. So my goal for the video is to make your prep a little easier and hopefully to share an idea or two that can be used in your game. So this adventure, the House of Lament, is for character levels 1 through 3. It would be interesting to try it starting out at first level. Uh, we actually started when I ran it at third level, and it was still a handful for the characters. Uh, there will, of course, be spoilers abounding here, so um, if you're going to haven't played it yet, and you're going to play it soon, please uh, come back and watch this after you have. Okay, so the author, I'm not sure who the author is for this one, it's, uh, you know, the full credits in Ben Richten's guide have uh, quite a few authors there. The uh, project lead was F. Wesley Schneider. And the maps that I'm using, or the maps that I used to run the adventure, were from Heroic Maps. There'll be a link in the video description to the page on DriveThruRPG. This is the page for the House of Lament DM Resources Pack. Uh, just amazingly beautiful maps and several resources here, which I put to good use in the adventure as well. So I highly recommend that for your game. The pictures here I got out of Van Richten or the House of the Mint or the whole uh, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft um, for the two pictures I used for the cover art there. And let's look at the map overview. So. I'll zoom out here to see how I have the whole thing laid out. So when I do a game in Roll20, I like to do everything on one page. So I don't have to have the players go in between pages. I don't use Fog of War, but it's still, it's easy to use Fog of War, I mean, dynamic lighting. It's still easy to use a dynamic lighting with a one-page setup. You just put boxes around the areas, you know, like walls around the areas to separate all the areas into separate pages. I like this here um, and using not Fog of War because I kind of like the, I mean, the maps are gorgeous. I like the players to get more and more of the map revealed and just be able to see the amazing artwork of it. Okay, so here's the overall layout. Let's look at some of the details for the map here. So we have the crossroads where the characters first meet, just a rainy forested crossroads. And then the next place they'll see is the house itself. So I put the house of lament here with the roof on it. If I go to the map layer, I can put the roof to the back. So you can see there's, I have the ground level map shown there with its full outline of the terrain around the house. I'll put it back to the back. So here's the house again. Again, more images from the uh, book itself here. As the characters approach the house, they'll see that. I need to do. A, I didn't have this wagon before. I need to do a little better job of feathering the edges of it. I'll talk about that in another room before. But I used, for the ghosts, you're given several choices. And I really liked using uh, Van Richten, since it's the namesake of the book. And also since he has a son who's a ghost, so it played more into the ghost stories themselves. So when the players first arrive, I will reveal this map here. And then when they start exploring the house, we come down to the first floor. I have the first floor map here. And if I was out, you know, revealing it, I of course wouldn't reveal the pictures to the start. And I also wouldn't reveal these two upper tower levels at the start. Let's talk about the tower. So the tower actually is kind of independent of the other areas of the house. There's no way to access it from the other areas. But, um, nonetheless, it goes through four different maps of the house. And really, you only need these two sections here. So you can show, I put elevation markers of 10 feet and 20 feet and 30 feet on there. I didn't have that when I ran it the first time. And when I ran it the first time, I also didn't have these out, you know, these inset maps of the tower. Instead, I was like scrolling and panning back and forth as the players climbed the tower. So you saw... If you watch the video, see that I took up a little bit of time for doing that. So this, I think, is a good idea. Just kind of, you know, crop out the, the towers and put in some elevation markers for yourself there. Um, okay, so more on the first floor here. You can see I just put the room numbers there. I have where the chimney witch is identified. I like to put maps on the DM layer or notes in the DM layer to remind me of what's going on. You'll read in the book that any of these doors can be stuck. So you could put a note by any door saying it's stuck as well on the DM layer. Just to remind yourself if you had one in particular, or you can just do that on the fly. So from the first level, going up to the second level, here we go. 
And on the second level, there is a master bedroom, which once the house is awakened, there is a plague zombie in the master bedroom. And the player should be able to hear the coughing of the plague zombie before they come through the door. So I always like to put a note on the map to remind myself of anything that happens before um, players enter a room. So I put that note for coughing into the master bedroom there if it's awakened. I also have the witch chimney again noted here. In this room, I actually uh, I used something from Heroic Maps suggestions where this bathtub is full of opaque water, and I had kind of a tie to the chimney witch as I put some embers under the tub, heating the tub from the fire, and the witch came up out of the tub to confront the players. So there's what I did there. And then, oh, let me go back to Area 5A. So Area 5A, it has where when the house is awakened, it changes appearance, and there's actually blood streaming down the wall. So to do that, I just used on the map, I cropped out a section that was just the tower. So if I go to the map and I right click and I go to back, and now I have the awakened tower and I have the blood stains on the floor, etc. If you're running this and you're at all squeezed for time, or you want to give the players a better chance of succeeding, if they are not communing with the ghost uh, Dranzorg, then they should not see that outline because it's almost irresistible for players <laughs> to, to click to smash that out that thing open and they get Dranzorg added to the mix when they're also trying to go after Mara so it can make it pretty tough. So I would not reveal that next time I ran it. I did the first time I ran it and you can see it led to quite a bit of extra combat for the for the group. Okay then I just right click on it and go to back there for putting it back to the non-awakened state of the house. I use the non-awakened state of the house for most of the house. <clears throat> um, just use the awakened state, which in Heroic Maps provides both, for the areas where there's change. Uh, so I did that. Okay, then back to the second level. And then on up to the third, so you got the stairs that go up to the third level. The third level's got some locked doors in it, so again, there's where I like to put, you know, if the door's locked, or there's also a locked chest in this room, so I put locked by that. Interesting side note, there's a secret door, a secret room here. There is no description of this room in the adventure, so that is pretty interesting. Uh, you can put it whatever you want to add into there. Also, this bag describes how it has claw marks across the floor. I actually added these, so these are actually on the map layer, but they're my own drawing of claw marks across the floor to the bag. Then, um, we have the painting that the ghouls come out of. We have the nursery with the locked door in the nursery. And we got the witch chimney again. Now, I didn't have the witch interact in this room at all. You can see the, the witch stone is actually on this level right behind there. Uh, but I didn't have it interact. The fight here is pretty difficult with these carionettes and the scarecrow once the house awakens. The party luckily did a lot of fire damage, so the scarecrow went down pretty easy. The carionettes actually surprised me. It was the first time I'd ever run carionettes. And they have where they can like possess a character. And then if the doll is destroyed while the character is possessed, the character dies. So that surprised me. It's like a instant death method where it's really hard to die in 5e. And uh, so that leads into the next room here where the children are. For the children I put in, it describes how they have um, some little toys that their spirits are inside. So I put the toys there such that the characters can take them with them. So when a character died out in this nursery room while leaving, after they take the kids out, the house awakens. Um, I put in, um, well, I just had one of the children's spirits take possession of the character's body, so the character, the player of that character, could keep playing the adventure, even though their their character was dead and would have to be raised from the dead later. Since they had no quick access to raise from the dead, I did it that way. All right, so that is up to the upper levels of the house. Now... There's various ways the house can awaken, but one of the main ways is when they take the kids out. The thing I was doing, um, there was no need for them to in any way interact with the children. And that's another thing you might consider if you don't have time, is you could like completely block that door so no one can get into the kids' room if you're not dealing with that ghost story. But I think if you have um, you know, two four-hour sessions to run it and you're pretty quick with running it, you can get two of the ghost stories in. If you're going to try and do all three, uh, first of all, the players might need to be fourth level, not third, and you might need to uh, a lot like three sessions to it to get that all all done to your satisfaction. 
let's see, here's the uppermost level of the tower. Again, I don't use this map of the tower. I use the other one that's inset on the ground level. But here is the uh, Witch's Walk at the top. Or is it Widow's Walk? I forget. Um, and here is the chimney with the Witch Stone on it. Okay, so now coming back down to if the characters come in on the ground level and go down the stairs to the basement, they come to the basement room. So here's the basement room. It's got the Grimshiths in there. It's got a storage area. The wall's blocking it. And here's one where I use the map. So I take this map and I send it to the back. The Awakened map, you'll see the wall will open. The, the boxes and crates will rearrange. If you had a lot of time, that'd be something interesting if you could make an animated a gif of that, but I didn't, I didn't have time to do something like that. All right, so I'll just send this back. Now you have the pathway, the hole, and the characters can get to this room. I have here, um, let's put this back to the back. I put in here on the object layer, a squiggly line. That was a rope that the party used, so I'll just take that to the side. You might want to keep one to the side. There's a pretty good chance the party will use a rope in that room. Um, then the room below, I put the outline of the hole in the ceiling there in the room below. I just trace that on this level or trace it over here and drag it over onto this map. Okay, so now the ground level of the party is dealing with Mara. I've been toying around with how I would like to do elevation. I think what I'm sitting on is I want to do elevation here. So Mara being 10 feet, I'll put that there and I'll put zero in this field so that it can be shown. I can delete these and save. All right, so I put that object there. So now that indicates to the party that Mars 10 feet up off the ground and, you know, flying. And then if, I'll use the other part of it for 10 hit points. So if she had 10 hit, 10 hit points, I could put that there. Save that. There we go. But she doesn't. So if the characters don't, you can just delete that. If you delete it, then altitude won't be shown. But if you put zero there, then it will show the altitude. There we go. Then we have the tentacles, which are shadows. So I just grab some tentacles off the internet and use that for for that token. And that room, yeah, that's that room. Now when the fight actually starts, you can bring out this picture. It's a pretty cool picture. In the first encounter, let me go back to the first encounter there, they can find a planchette. So good to have an image of a planchette to show them. Again, right out of Vendrickton's Guide to Ravenloft. Out of Enrichton's Guide to Ravenloft, I also had this uh, spirit board. So when the seances are happening, we can move the punchette around the spirit board to various things. There we go. And then, um, so while you're playing this, when the characters come up to the entry and they might experience, encounter the ghost of Erasmus, I did not read up on Erasmus in much detail, but on page 180 of the hardcover, there is a detailed description of Erasmus. So I definitely suggest reading that. And it's really neat, the interaction between him and Van Richten, how Van Richten can't in any way sense his presence. So you can play that up to some spooky effect during the adventure. Um, other background information. So I like to share background information with the characters or the players of the characters before the adventure. And then if they can reveal it in character, I can award inspiration to them for that. If they don't, then I might call for, you know, knowledge nature roles, or knowledge history roles, etc. But some items of knowledge here, we got the bag man. That's pretty neat when they find the bag of holding up on the third level. So if you can see that, you know, little bit of legend and myth with the character, that comes out of page uh, 225 of the Vanderwitten's Guide. Then we got Ezra. Ezra comes up a lot in a couple places. So her symbol appears in room 21A. Let me just grab, yeah, I'll grab this here. So 21A, boom. Here, this modest room holds beds, foot lockers, writing desks, and chairs. A plaque bears a shield crossed with a sprig of belladonna. There is where I could ask for a, you know, a religion check, unless the person already knows it, and then can reveal it. Then it comes into play much more in room 23 and 24. So room 23 will have a description of the door there. The nursery lies in disarray. Toy chests, bookshelves, and chairs sized for children lie in splinters of colorful wood. Hand-painted stick figures, people and animals, mundane and bizarre, cover the walls. If the uh, door is touched, then I see 23A. Oops, wrong one. 23A. 
When you touch the door, a glowing symbol of a shield appears amid woodwork for an instant, then vanishes. And then, of course, if they, I'll ask for a 15 religion check, or they can reveal it themselves. If they make the religion check, I will reveal this information. Uh, the glowing symbol of a shield that appeared on the door reminds you of the holy symbol of Ezra, but it is missing the belladonna sprig that normally crosses the shield. And then if they present the belladonna sprig, when you present the sprig of belladonna, a glowing symbol of a shield crossed by a glowing sprig of belladonna appears amid the woodwork for an instant and vanishes. So all that is stuff that can be just really kind of organic with the characters. Uh, you can find info about Ezra in Vendorton's Guide on pages 64 and 178. And I'll put all this in the description below for you too. Uh, Priests of Ossibus, that can come up in room 21. Witch stones, of course, can come up with regard to one of the quests. And then Mark of the Raven comes up in a lot of different rooms. Room 3 and 22 and 26 and 32 all bring up information about the Mark of the Raven. And in that one, I kind of segregated it into two levels of knowledge. People who have history and arcana might know just the basics. And if a person has history and arcana or arcana and religion, I can give them more detail about, you know, its origins with uh, the Holy Symbol of Raven kind. <clears throat> The rewards of the adventure, there's four main magic items. You got the bag of holding up above. You got the sword of vengeance that Mara has that the card party could find at the end. The berserk battle axe under the deck if they're going after the quest with Dranzorg. And then, of course, the deck of illusions that the party can find at the end. So that is House of Lament. It has been an amazingly fun adventure to run. I am actually really looking forward to running it again. When I get a chance, I'm going to run it in person, I think, here pretty soon. Um, I might even print these maps out because they're just so gorgeous. Uh, so I hope you have a great time. If you do, hey, leave a comment below. Let us know some tips and tricks that you learned while you ran the adventure. Thank you for watching. I hope your next game is great.